Welcome to task 0-5001, demonstrate air and ground team coordination. This task is from the UAST UASMP task guide published by the Civil Air Patrol. And so to begin, what crew responsibilities strongly impact the ability to coordinate your own team and to work well with multiple teams? So strong execution of these six responsibilities will help you achieve excellent coordination with multiple ground and air elements. So radios are by far the preferred way to communicate within uh, Civil Air Patrol, and you'll assign primary radio responsibility to your first technician, but the pilot will still have a radio. And then be sure to brush up on your radio skills or conduct refresher training if the crew is rusty or green. And the radios used inside uh, CAP are the EF Johnson variety with a handheld and mission base unit pictured here. You'll learn about them in iCut training, which you definitely want to take if you haven't already. And as you can see, you'll be contacting almost everyone using these radios. Yeah, but you can't use the EF Johnsons to monitor private or commercial general aviation, so if possible, secure an air band radio to monitor what those planes might be saying. It's important to monitor only. Um, do not contact general aviation without clearing ahead of time with a comms officer who has the authority to approve you. And if you can use radios reliably, to coordinate with nearby airplanes, you can save a point on your ORM matrix by choosing aircraft in areas of operation with coordination. Good for two points instead of three. And just remember, higher score is more risk, lower score is less risk. Okay, and then at a minimum, you'll need a basic understanding of GPS coordinates to do this task well. Uh, methods of doing this will vary due to different hardware software combinations. This particular method works if you have a DJI GO 4 app on your phone or iPad and uh, a compatible drone. So try this while the drone is on the ground first, but the key is that this method does work in the air. Um, so you'll back out of the main flight screen during flight and get here. And then you'll touch the sandwich bars near the top. Then choose Find My Drone from the menu. And so here's the exact GPS coordinates of the drone now, and these numbers will move as the drone flies around. Okay, GPS 101, the left number 39 goes up as you head north and goes down as you head south. Um, the right number, negative 75, goes up towards negative 76 as you head left and down as you head right. So you can do two things using this method, either fly out over a target of interest and retrieve the GPS coordinates, then radio them to ground team, or you can receive GPS coordinates from ground team, manually fly out to them and investigate. And so, and then once you get close, slide down the coordinates menu and touch the camera icon that appears bottom right, which pops up the FPV view for situational awareness and confirmation of targets without ever even leaving this mode. <coughs> Even though you've lost V-loss, if anyone in visual control of the drone can no longer determine its heading, um, if VLOS is required by CAP in the FAA unless you have waivers in place, and NHQ will advise you if there are any waivers. Now, teamwork is your best bet to overcoming VLOS restrictions. Um, make a chain of technicians and visual observers extending out as far as you need, and then hand off visual control to each one in turn so you continuously maintain VLOS. And I've included a mock script at the bottom um, for handoff of visual control. Uh, VLOS can be broken, but there are rules to it, and so a break in VLOS must be due to what's called operational necessity. Uh, those are things like checking your radio and adjusting to a new channel, or looking down at telemetry data to check battery percentages. The key being, you must retain the ability to quickly recover VLOS. So practically speaking, within moments of looking back up, you've recovered VLOS. And this guidance is taken directly from FAA Advisory Circular 107-2. 
okay, a drone can overcome the field of vision issues affecting ground teams. You should anticipate and capitalize on this advantage by maintaining situational awareness and recognizing opportunities as they develop to see over something tall or to scout an area quickly or to check on top of that hill. Um, keep in mind though that whatever you see, be prepared to relay the information in exacting detail to the ground team. And ground teams are often navigating unfriendly terrain while loaded with gear. Uh, comparatively speaking, an SUAS can get to any given target much faster. Now, if a ground team is relying on you to lead them in somewhere or to continue circling over an object until they arrive, demonstrate patience by waiting for them and following through on the first target before you continue checking on other targets. Your probability of detection goes up significantly each time you increase the number of eyes watching your live feed. Secondary technicians or onlookers at your field base are good targets to enlist and provide feeds to. There's three good ways to do this, goggles, HDMI cable, and HDMI wireless. Uh, the goggles will only work um, with some SUAS to produce a second feed. So this Mavic Pro pictured here is capable of producing two signal feeds, one to the controller and one to the goggles. Other SUAS may only be capable of putting out a single signal to the controller, meaning that you'll have to choose between either a phone tablet or the goggles. If you have a controller that's equipped with an HDMI out port, you can send a feed to a TV and have it watched by one or more people. Now keep in mind that's in addition to the feed sent from the USB port to your phone or tablet, two total feeds. <coughs> And this is a Phantom 3 controller, which was upgraded with an aftermarket DJI HDMI model for 110 bucks. And we upgraded from this one. Notice you gain the additional HDMI port and the DJI CAN bus, which is useful for advanced data logging. And unfortunately, this Mavic style controller has no way to include an HDMI port, so you are limited to one signal from these controllers. <coughs> And for the wireless HDMI method, you replace the cable with an HDMI wireless extender kit. Just plug in the broadcast dongle to your controller's HDMI port, and then hook up the base module, which is that red box on the TV, and transmit. All right, and so uh, before you leave mission base, you'll need to get all of these details. Let's check them out. Know thine frequencies, it's mission critical. And repeaters are big antenna stations placed atop tall hills or mountains in a strategic way. Uh, they take up your broadcast signal and rebroadcast it over a wider area, dramatically increasing your overall range for transmitting radio messages. So keep in mind there may be more than one repeater for your area of operation. Simplex channels, also known as tactical channels, are what you use to talk line of sight to a person. There are usually a few of these being used, so write them down. And then cap aircraft are only monitoring a few channels at a time, so be sure to know which ones those are, and then determine the hailing procedures to contact those cap aircraft. Uh, a typical hailing procedure might look like the picture here. So step one, communications go through the repeater first, where both parties establish contact and agree to move to a tactical channel. Then step two, establish contact on the tactical channel and continue communications. Now, doing it this way helps reduce overall traffic through the repeaters. And you may be operating on a task force or strike team with other ES agencies, so check the comms plan for those specialty frequencies and hailing procedures. If no comms plan exists yet, try to work with a comms officer and make one. Then establish your check-in periods up front with base and any ground teams you're working with. Use manned aviation as a rough guide for missing aircraft time windows. They get two hours without checking in before base initiates missing aircraft procedures. Now, if ground team has been missing their check-ins with the SUAS team, that may be an indicator of lost comms. So use appropriate methods to deal with this. 
Then keep in mind, people familiar with the area of operations may be aware of dead zones. Uh, be sure to factor those into your planning. Oftentimes, sorties traveling into dead zones have reduced check-in requirements. You can only really overcome dead zones by passing messages back to base through overhead cap planes or by interrupting your sortie to drive outside the dead zone and pass messages. Having the same topographical maps as ground team can be a tremendous help to team coordination. You know, with the same maps, um, SUAS team has a clear understanding of overall terrain challenges, which can result in better anticipation of the needs for a drone's perspective over and beyond obstacles. Also, ground teams can make pinpoint scouting location requests that SUAS teams understand, and then the SUAS team's directions back to ground team can be very exact. Get as many details as you can about the vehicle description of ground teams expected to be in the area, and be sure to inform others about your vehicles as well. Other wings have reported using removable duct tape X's on top of vans. That would help tremendously with identification from the air. But keep in mind, decals that identify vehicles from the air is a sensitive topic for the Air Force. So you absolutely need to clear top of vehicle details, excuse me, decals with an incident commander or next highest authority prior to installing anything. Okay, you want to know the exact uniform of ground teams you'll be operating with. Uh, this will allow you to identify teams from the air, especially if you have to pick them out from other hikers in the area or other emergency services members on scene. Rendezvous points are important to establish. These are spots where ground teams decide they'll head for or fall back to during the sortie. And rendezvous points can be especially useful to SUAS teams if they lose awareness of ground team while conducting aerial searches or if a lost comm scenario happens. In both those cases, you'll know where to backtrack and search for ground teams at. Just be sure to make your rendezvous time windows plus or minus 15 minutes and choose easily visible landmarks or intersections of roads. You can see in the image that we've identified the fixed SUAS base of operations and two rendezvous points for ground team, one at an intersection of roads and one near the northwest side of an easily visible landmark, the Cave Creek Historic Dam. At, during a sortie, your radio communications will rarely be available 100% of the time, so have your nonverbal communications plan pinned down in advance. And there are things that both ground teams and SUAS teams can do. If ground team finds that they're receiving radio messages but cannot broadcast messages themselves, they can use these techniques if communication is needed to proceed with the sortie. The moment they suspect comms have gone down, they can slow or stop the vehicle and look for any inbound SUAS. A drone might be inbound to their location to begin lost comm maneuvers. Then only if a drone is actively observing ground teams. Um, if they're still receiving messages but can't send back out, they can blink their headlights to say message received. If they're no longer receiving anything and can't send out, they can turn on their flashers. You know, beyond this, feel free to get creative with other solutions. Maybe use colored flags that signify certain responses. Uh, whatever you choose, just be sure to rehearse it well and distribute a reference sheet with all maneuvers described to both ground team and SUAS. Otherwise, you might not know um, what's going on. Okay, SUAS teams can use a variety of maneuvers when confirming messages, requesting actions, and asking teams to follow. If an SUS team discovers they can receive radio messages but no longer send them out, they can use these techniques if communications are needed to proceed with the sortie. I've added the multi-rotor versions underneath the plane recommendations. Um, please pause here to read through each one. And then the biggest thing to remember with these maneuvers is that they were taken directly from CAP's manned aviation instructional material. This means that except for the objective is here maneuver, applying these maneuvers to SUAS requires teams to coordinate on speed. Now, ground teams must be traveling at half or less of your drone's maximum speed, otherwise you'll never overtake them to perform these maneuvers. I'll zoom in on these one at a time. Um, go ahead and pause and look over their descriptions if you haven't seen them before.
So we have daisy chain, U-turn, turn, stop or dismount, and objective is here. The two nonverbal maneuvers exclusive to multi-rotors are revving the engines and bouncing. Rev the engines while passing overhead ground teams or bounce within view of ground teams to let them know they should follow you. And moving along, uh, the last question in this task asks you to apply what's been learned and demonstrate coordination. Now I've done that here with an imagined scenario and paperwork. You can see we've got SUAS and ground team member names, designations, uniforms, vehicles, and relevant vehicle decals, check-in times, maps, rendezvous points, communications frequencies, and lost comms procedures. And so in this scenario, we're looking for missing persons known to have been in the Cave Buttes recreational area recently. SUAS, ba SUAS base <laughs> is up on a hill overlooking the large valley. And then the ground team is on foot and will proceed west along Cave Creek Road. Rendezvous 1 is an intersection. Rendezvous 2 is a landmark the northwest side of Cave Creek Historic Dam. Now, when ground team descends into the foliage, we appear to lose signal here, which is a shame because the SUS team has just identified two potential targets here and here. So the SUS team does a route search along Cave Creek Road, picks ground team back up, then performs the bouncing follow me maneuver and leads ground team to the targets one at a time. And just moving along, I do want to take a minute and thank the Unsplash artist who provided a ton of visual content for this presentation. A big thanks goes to everyone on this list. And that, that concludes the task. Thanks for joining me today, and we'll see you in the next one.